the kind folk at Regenier have sent me these two swords. Uh, this one is, if you like, a, a, a re recreation of a fighting sword, and this is the Feder version of it. Uh, they call this, I think, the Italian Feder, and this uh, they're calling a Spadone, uh, which is an Italian term meaning a uh, great big sword. Uh, you might call it a Montante, a Montante if you're uh, Spanish. You might call it a Schlachtschwert if you're German, which just means battle sword or slaughter sword. Really, they, they all just mean big sword. Now, I would say that for me, these are not great swords, uh, but I know that someone somewhere is even now throwing his arms up in the air in horror. <gasps> he said great sword. Is he even allowed to say that word? And how dare he use it so inaccurately? But uh, I just put that one down for a second. Um, a great sword, as I've seen in, in many a museum, uh, they're sometimes six, seven foot long, and they've got blades that wide. And these, this second set of quillons here is somewhere around there and is big. And this part of the blade is thick and sometimes covered in leather so that you can put one hand there. You've got a second set of quillons and you can use it like a short spear. Whereas this, I would say is different in kind. Yes, you could say it's a two-handed sword, and some people say, ah, he should call it a, a Zweihander, but that's just German for two-handed sword, and there are lots of other words which just mean two-handed sword, so they really don't uh, uh, help. So I'm not going to argue much about the, the terms, but anyway, uh, I've been sent to try it out. As you can see, it's brand new. I haven't even got the wrapping off the, uh, the grip yet, uh, so let's give them a whirl. Okay. Here we have Zach on the right with the red dotted knees trying out the Spadoni against a long sword. Zach tries out the guard positions he has been taught. Will this help? He tries one more and is attacked as he was changing. Jake acknowledges a hit to his head. Did you see it? Let's view that frame by frame. This could possibly be a hit on Zack, but it's impossible to be sure. Here, Jake's longsword clearly hits the Spadoni's grip between Zack's hands. Zack presses his counterattack and just here, possibly lightly brushes the front of Jake's mask. He then, with the sword still held out, brings down the back edge onto Jake's wrist with a force that a decent stout pair of gloves would be good against. Jake then blocks an attack that wasn't going to reach him anyway with his arm. Let's see that full speed again. Hit on the head as well. I think this makes clear the impossibility of refereeing fencing matches by eye. They reset. A deft snipe to the hand there. A few more changes of guard pose. Jake winds in and... did he hit? I'm guessing not. Yep, fairly definite hit there at the end of a decently big swing, so in a real fight that would have had quite a bit of chop to it. This next one is a goodie. Zack ducks and uses his extra reach for a thrust from low, then backs out quickly before the counter. These hits are right. Oh, sorry, these hits are right. Yeah. Asking after the comfort of his foe. Very polite. Jake tries a big number one cut and winds in over the top and makes it count. You good? Yep. I don't know how I'll pull that off. <laughs> Let's see if I can name all the guards shown. Tail, Fool, Long Point, Fool, Plow, Roof, and... Oh! Uh, clashy Clash and Stabby Stab. <laughs> That's why I wear a dagger. Always wear a dagger. It means I don't have to learn grappling as well. Well, so far I think you'll agree that this looks much like a fight between two men with longswords. Zack doesn't seem to have adapted his style to the new weapon, but seems to be getting longsword moves to work fine. We'll go for another. Yep. Yeah, that wouldn't have done a lot. On the back. Shameless double. Yep. That was a double hit. Well, in HEMA competition, that might have been scored as a double. I can't help feeling, though, that in a real fight, Jake would have a slight cut to his tunic while Zack was decapitated. Let's see it again, and you be the judge. Jake tests Zack's reactions. Nothing. They both go into a high ox guard and Zack gets in a hit as he withdraws. 
Jake went to sleep there, almost as though his life didn't depend on it. So, what do you think of the Regenie Italian feather? Uh, I felt like I was cheating. But it's too easy to beat someone with a longsword? I mean, we're... Say, I'd say we're reasonably similar in skill level, but I felt like uh, I was fighting someone much less experienced with a longsword. It's sort of like... It just, it's just, you're just better with it, because I can be strong in the bind, because it's a bit of a heavier weapon, I've got more reach. Uh, it's just, yeah, it feels a bit like cheating. <laughs> so what's it like to be on the receiving end? So, at first it felt like a longsword, but then as you start like, trying to probe so that he would go in for a thrust so I could displace it, it was a bit heavier to deal with mm -hmm. um, and harder to displace. I had to do a lot more like flourishes and stuff to try and make him go one way to go around the other way. Um, and it surprisingly acts very light, at, like the same way as a longsword by going against it. Yeah. Uh, doesn't seem too much heavy. It felt very nimble and I felt like I was not putting anywhere near as much effort yeah. into that fight as you were. Yeah. I felt like I was very lackadaisical just going for a thing or two here and there mm -hmm. and it, most of them worked and you when you did get some really nice hits yeah. on me. But when you did you really worked with them oh, yeah. and like all of my hits I don't feel like I really earned that much. The two Sith Lords meet again. And now the circle is complete. Now we have Regenier's prototype Hema Spear versus the Spadone. And predictably, this spear scores the first hit. I have another video all about those spears. Zack now tries winding in and sort of gets a hit, but it isn't a proper thrust. The spear tip is dragged across the target. Here, Jake might do well to back off a bit and then charge in against the spear. As long as the spear holds the initiative, it will probably win. Dead. Oh, that was too hard. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oops! Yeah, yeah. A bit of an owl moment, it yeah, seems, okay. but these yeah, men don't make a that. fuss. <laughs> I'm okay. I think it was a double. Yeah, I think so. Wasn't a very solid hit from the spear. Bit of a scuff. The masks and bibs make the head target much bigger. Without them, I think that spear thrust would have missed entirely. Aha! Will Jake take the initiative now? He's ready to half-sword, but he hesitates and Zack sees that he has to get aggressive. He scores a light arm hit and goes to quarterstaff yeah. to keep Jake at a safe distance. Last one this way round. And the spear scores a hit one-fifth of a second, that's just five frames, before the afterblow. Was that a double? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Got nicked on the, uh, on the arm. The fighters want to score hits and don't work as hard to keep themselves safe as you would in a real duel. Seems that wasn't quite a hit on Zack, but might have been if he'd had a bigger nose. Zack's working the distance quite well here. Spadone has an ideal range, which is long for a sword, but still shorter than the spear, so Zack is trying to get to that ideal distance. The only snag is that Jake keeps spearing him while he tries. Again, he closes to the right range, but he then hasn't got time for a decent swing, so it's only a touch of the sword rather than anything that would take an arm off. Again, Zack gets to the right range and moves to stay there, but it all gets a bit caught up and awkward. Eventually he lands a hit when Jake again lets his foot off the pedal. Oh, I one-handed thrust there. Almost worked. Finally, Zack gets it all to work. He closes to the right distance, guarding himself as he gets past the spearhead, and then still leaves himself enough room to get in a big, clean swing. I should repeat that this day was scorching hot, which to some degree explains why these men in thick black clothing are struggling a bit. Zack is getting the hang of it now, and I think scores a hit to a hand or a wrist. This one looks and sounds like a clean Zwerchow cut under the spear to the chest. There, but just listen to the differing reports. What happened there? Uh, I think he got me in the I leg, but the, maybe superficial, not really. I grabbed his uh, thing and then had my point on line. <laughs> that was fun. Uh, spear's harder but easier, if that makes sense. So it's more taxing on the body, but it's easier to win the engagement, I think. I think I'd agree with that. Yeah. Um, so spears are good, you're telling us? Yeah, yeah. With the, with the, the spadone, I felt like I really had to bind heavily with the spear and close in quickly and that could work, but with the spear it's, you can really just find an opening and just go for it. You can really control the centre with the spear. It's just so much more mass, like, you don't need to put as much in to take, 
to have that pressure and move their weapon aside. Mm -hmm. I felt that my fighters were flagging a bit, so I took remedial action. Let's see if this makes a difference. Zack, perhaps buoyed up by his cheerleaders, attacks with greater tenacity and vigour. He doesn't let up and yes, he scores a hit. But coolly, he does not acknowledge his supporters. Jake comes in, looking for vengeance, thrusting high and low, determined to keep the initiative. But then he hesitates, stared down through the mask by Zack's steely countenance. Zack closes, but is unable to land a blow, and the larger Jake grapples him. The cheerleaders sound worried for Zack. How will it all end? In messiness, violence and stabbing. Well, that was just a sample size of two, so not very conclusive. So we are running the cheerleading experiment again. Here comes Jake, but no, he's he walks back out of frame for some reason. And oh, no, 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 the cheerleaders are receding into the background. No matter, I reposition and gesture frantically for the fighters to enter shot. Start fighting. Start fighting now. What, what are they waiting for? Guys, guys, get there, fight, quick. And here they are, just in time for the lull in the routine. You've got to be better at making an entrance than that. And step will change, and down to the floor. So... Uh, yeah. Oh, definite hit there with the spear. Oh no, drop the pom-poms. I have to say that I have a feeling that our chaps have somewhat filtered out the cheerleaders by this stage. There's some more fighting there. Oh, come on! Look at the effort being put in behind you both. And the last hit is by the sword. Thanks, gals! It is my sad duty to report that my oldest and most favourite sponsor, The Great Courses Plus, is no more. Yes, it has gone to that great cyber cloud in the sky. But before you start rushing around, wailing, gnashing your teeth and rubbing ash into your hair, understand this, that though of course I have enjoyed being sponsored by them, have gained so much from their many courses by great lecturers from around the world, from the great universities, and have marvelled, yes marvelled, there's no other word for it really, at the sheer quality of their scholars' cradles. All is not quite over. You see, the day of the Great Courses Plus is over. But the day of Wondrium has begun! Yes! Wondrium is the new site, my new sponsor! It's like the Great Courses Plus, but bigger and better! It has teamed up with the likes of Magellan and Craftsy and Kino Lorber to bring you more material. And it has a new name, which is shorter! And and it's got it's got wonder in it, and it's, and, and they, they've, 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 they've they've taken wonder and they've they've mixed it with barium. Or, or, or solarium, planetarium, uh, d delirium, I don't know, but uh, there's a, stick, stick with the wonder, it's wonder! And this wonderful site uh, now has also short form videos, which they're putting more and more on, and uh, these include um, mind-blowing scientific facts, so you can dip in quickly, watch a short video, and um, a, a word of safety about mind-blowing. Um, you, your mind can only be blown once, you know, so think carefully before having your mind blown. Uh, I'm actually fairly convinced that their, their facts, though interesting, are not literally mind-blowing, so I think you're fairly safe to watch all these videos and learn science, like um, a video I watched on the uh, Einstellung effect, which was uh, discovered in uh, 1942, or at least given that name in 1942 by a uh, Lu Luchins, I think it was, um, who did all sorts of experiments, including uh, putting chess problems uh, to uh, chess players of varying uh, abilities, and he found that if someone is quite good at a skill and they've learned some methods that work, then 
their faith in those methods will blind them to much simpler and easier solutions to the same problems. Uh, and so quite good chess players would see, ah, they'd see some familiar pattern coming up and this would uh, enable them to make a checkmate, for instance, but in fact there was a much simpler and easier checkmate available, which they just missed. Sometimes, in some tests, all of them just missed it because they were blinded by their reasonably high knowledge. But interestingly, the really, really, really great chess players, the grand masters and so forth, they tended to spot the, uh, the simpler alternative and they weren't just um, repeating the same patterns over and over. Um, Francis Bacon, actually, it was in 1620 that he, he first described pretty much the same effect. Uh, later in the video, uh, they talk about uh, Wazon. Yes, uh, Peter Wazon. He of the Wazon test. See my website. Link in the description. Um, and uh, uh, he, of course, uh, coined the term confirmation bias, which uh, some people confuse for the einstein effect. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's definitely related. Anyway, oh, Darwin uh, is, is a great example here because Darwin uh, said that uh, he would note down anything he came across which contradicted his theory uh, because otherwise he would forget that. He noticed that he had this uh, uh, tendency to forget stuff that wasn't convenient for his theory, so he would write stuff down and Dar Darwin was an absolutely good superb scientist and uh, thanks to thinking like that we got the origin of the species and yeah, but I'm getting rather off the point. Uh, what is the point? Well the point is you can go to um, wondrium.com stroke Lindy Beige and there find details of a free trial offer. So why not do that? You can click the link in the description and everything you need will just pop up on your screen. Oh, Wondrium. So I have here four swords. And uh, this one, I would say, is very definitely a one-handed sword. And at some point, we turn into two-handed swords. But at what point? Now, if I pick up this one, which is a, a spartha, this one is, as you can see, beautifully patterned, forged uh, down the center of its uh, uh, blade there. Uh, this one has a grip that is quite clearly designed for one hand. It has a big pommel, which is not weighted. Uh, this is for grip, but it's not for counterbalance. Um, which means that I can get a decent amount of chop with, with this uh, weapon. It's got a decent amount of thrust as well, and this is very definitely a one-handed weapon. You can see by the way the grip has been designed that it's always intended to be used in one hand, and its length and weight is such that I can very easily move it in one hand, and I feel that I'm in control. I can move it quickly and with power. Because it's got no pommel weight, uh, if I reach around someone's shield and just move from the wrist, I can, I can hack. Boom, I can hack like that with quite a bit of oomph and bring the, the blade down on them with some punch. So that's a one-handed sword. This Arnanda that I forged myself, um, this is intended to be uh, what some people call a bastard sword or a hand and a half sword. It's got a longer grip. Now clearly the maker of any sword is likely to make the grip to suit the way he thinks it's going to be used. And you can see that I can get a second hand on there and if I hold it towards the end of the pommel there's even a bit of a gap between my two hands. Now the idea is you can use this in one hand or two hands. And in one hand this is noticeably slower and more awkward uh, than the one-handed Spartha there. But I do feel that this would actually pack a reasonable punch and I'm reasonably in control of what I'm doing here. And I can very quickly swap to two hands and to one hand and then back to two. So I might, for instance, swap uh, to one hand for a long thrust to get a bit more range and then come back to two hands for a bit more control and power in the parries. So, a bastard sword or one and a half, um, or a hand and a half sword. So if I put those two <coughs> next to each other, you can see a substantial difference in the length. Now this, this is called a long sword, and next to the bastard sword, you can see it's only a little bit longer in the blade, but it's significantly longer in the handle. Here, I can put one, two, three complete hands and even slip that, slip that down a bit onto the pommel. So this has got a significantly longer grip. So clearly the designer of this thought, ah, this is going to be used in two hands. And now if I put my hand at the end here, ah, I feel I've got so much power and speed and control of this. Again, I can of course go to one hand and back, but if I use this in one hand only, it's got no oomph in the chop at all. The blade, as you can see up here, is really quite thin and light 
and it's got a, a big pommel counterbalancing down here on the end of a, a, a long uh, grip. If I hold it near the grip, uh, well, I've got a lot more reach, but now I've, it's really weak. And if I hold it there, it's really slow as well because of the way the, the hilt behaves in my hand. So though it's possible to use one of these in one hand, um, you really wouldn't choose to. This is uh, something which you might go to one hand for, but you're going to want to have two hands on it almost all of the time. Whereas this, you perhaps use with a shield in your other hand, taking that hand up, taking away the option to go to two hands. Um, but I would say that this is perhaps slightly better for getting in close and nasty. So if I go to a half sword and, and go to stab or try to wrestle him down using the, the quillons as, as, as a way of hooking him and, and tripping him and so forth, uh, this is a little bit uh, better for getting in and up close and dirty, I would say. Now we come to this one. Now, to contrast the length, this one comes up to about my belly button, just above my belly button, whereas this one comes up to my armpit, uh, which according to some treatises, I think it's Fiore, uh, says that that's the, the correct length for a long, long sword. And this is oh so definitely a two-handed weapon. You can see now, that, look how long the grip is. It's one, two, three, four hands long. So if I'm holding it like this, there's a huge gap between my two hands. So I've got a huge amount of leverage there. And yet, this is not what I would call a great sword. These things, remember? I mentioned them before. Here we have Olga Reinhardt, a German lady, demonstrating some great sword moves. And you can see how much effort she has to put into everything. Many of the swings move continuously into more swings, but when she has to bring the whole sword to a halt and swing it back the way it came, look how long it takes her to do it. And she isn't just using her arms, she is putting her whole body into it out of necessity. HEMA people like to talk of biomechanics, so I'll say this. Biomechanics. Vielen <laughs> Dank. Whereas this, this actually feels much closer um, to a long sword in the way it behaves in your hand. It's still decently nippy and you can really threaten a long distance away. So if I were to stand, for instance, facing you like this, um, can you guess whether I'm within range of you or not? Can I, can I get you, Cal, do you think? What do you reckon, Cal? Can I get you from here? Nah. No, no, okay. Oh yes, I can. And not just the camera too, I can go reach way past that and way past your head from here. I can threaten you from a very long way away. And uh, so yeah, so Dan, could you possibly actually get that? So if you get um, uh, Cal in shot, he thought it was out of range, but he flipping well wasn't. So uh, in this, uh, in Poster de Donne, the, 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 the pose, the position or the gait of the lady um, is a way of apparently not being a threat, but actually threatening a big area in front of you. Now, the treatises for these things tend to talk about skirmishing, or at least what to me sounds like skirmishing. Uh, it seemed, they seem to imply that you're fighting more than one opponent, and they talk about how to fight in a wide street, in a narrow street, on a bridge, and so forth. This doesn't sound like a battlefield, and it definitely doesn't sound like a duel either. This sounds like a skirmish with maybe 20 men aside, in which case, a man with, with one of these can threaten a huge area and can, with violence, sweep it around him and, and, and do a lot of crowd control. So people will, whoa, get out of the way of that when he starts swinging it about. Now, if he were in a dense formation of troops on a battlefield, you couldn't use this. You'd be just hitting all your mates around you all the time. Uh, but in a skirmish, one guy with, uh, with one of these could do a lot of useful crowd control and uh, as he splits uh, your opponents up or keeps them at bay or whatever, then the rest of the team could be ganging up, gaining local advantage and, and uh, beating people. Let's test that idea. We have a shot of brigands. Look, 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 brigandish. Give us your gold. I told Zack to whirl the sword around aggressively at anyone who came near him and scatter his foes. The brigands were told to close in if not threatened and back off if threatened. <laughs> yes, that seems to work. I think we should go back to the pub. All right, Zach. Point made. Now, this does behave quite differently in some ways from the longsword. 
Um, for those of you who are familiar with cricket, you might be familiar with, with uh, waiting at the crease and then doing a cover drive or forward defensive, whack, something like that. So I, I can do an upwards cut with this. But with this, I simply can't because <laughs> the ground or the floor is in the way. You can't really do that. You, I suppose you could do, you could do a backwards defensive, possibly, uh, being a, 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 um, using cricketing terminology again, but that's not a very useful stroke in sword play. Um, if I want to uh, do a diagonal uprise cut, even then I have to be fairly careful not to hit the ground on my way up. Olga again, and here she is demonstrating moves with the greatsword for use in a narrow alleyway against foes coming up behind you. Look how high she has to hold the hilt to avoid hitting the ground. Very awkward and exhausting. In fact, she catches the ground at one point despite her efforts. There. This greatsword is taller than she is, while my spadone, as you'll recall, comes up to my armpit. Now, something I discovered as I was playing around with this is that this is long enough to brace against my forearm like a one-handed spear. And this actually feels fine. This feels like quite a useful way so if I, uh, to use it. So if I had a shield, I could protect myself with that and use this as a one-handed spear. And it's almost as long as a lot of, uh, a lot of spears. And then when the time came, ditch the, ditch the uh, shield and then into action with two hands and lots of swirling around and, and possibly some whooping. Um, so, uh, yes, it's, I think it's a skirmisher's weapon. Um, it's not super hefty. Um, it's actually surprisingly whippy. When I've put it in the hands of, of people and they've tried sparring with it, um, most people have commented, oh, it, it behaves much more like an ordinary longsword than I was expecting. Um, they thought, ah, oh, look at the length of it. It'll be a huge, hefty, uh, clumpy, slow thing, but uh, no. It's actually pretty nippy. If I um, am clashing with someone with a very long blade and his blade slides down, these second tail quillons do protect me better because you can see if without them, the, the quill on its own might enable him just to catch my knuckle or coming the other way, I might still get hit in the thumb if uh, the swords clash at an awkward angle. So the second tail quillons keeps him back there. So if someone does slide down my blade at a horrible angle, I don't lose my thumb or my index finger. Some of you may be gnashing your gums in frustration because I haven't told you the lengths that define these various swords. You might think that one-handed swords go up to a certain length, then you get hand and half swords, then long swords, then spadones, then great swords, then stupendous swords. Well, the trouble is that if you lay out one of each of these in sequence, then someone will be able to say correctly that surviving examples of period swords are of all lengths in between, which makes a nonsense of the idea that there are five or so lengths of sword and that a sword type can be defined by length alone. Sorry. Now, one way to assess a blade is to whack it on the side and see how it reverberates. Now, I hope you can see that the top is going doing, 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 moving around and the bottom here is going doing, 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 as well but there is a point there where the blade is not moving at all and it doesn't matter where i hit it i can hit it down here and this bit here is still i can hit it up there and the point that is still is still the same the way it reverberates shows you if you like where the sweet spot of the blade is so on this one it's there which means that if I am swinging this sword and I hit someone with that bit of the blade, I won't get any shiver. The whole blade won't go in my hand. And uh, if you want to cut something, um, you, you want to find out where the sweet spot of your sword is. And ideally, so they say, use that bit. Although actually the tip, of course, goes faster. And so if the thing you're cutting is not tremendously substantial, you may just want to use uh, the, the tip for its sheer speed. And if your edge alignment is just right, uh, you may slice straight through it and you don't get that horrible doing, 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 doing. Um, But a lot of people will look at the blade and go, hmm, yes, and they will nod sagely as though they know something really important about where that, that point of reverberation is. Another thing you can do is you can turn it over and you can move it about. So uh, as I do this, uh, can you see that the tip is hardly moving at all as I do this? But as I move my hand up the grip, it changes the way it moves in my hand loads. So now you can see the tip is moving loads and the bit that's stationary is somewhere around, I would say it was somewhere around that sort of height. 
Um, not perfectly stationary, of course, but you can see that the point around it naturally, uh, the point around which it naturally wants to pivot, and the higher I go up, the more that changes. So now you can see the tip's moving loads, and the stationary part is, ooh, I don't know, it was about there, somewhere around there. So the further down you go, now where you hold a sword uh, tends to be up towards the quillons with, uh, with your right hand, if you're right-handed. So it's up there that is perhaps uh, the most important. And the fact that the, the, the sword wants to leave the tip still and move the rest of it around it can be quite significant for balance. So if I swing this against an enemy, clang, and he uh, parries somehow, I might want to then thrust over the top and into him. And I can do that with the right balance because the tip it will be happy to stay still and let the rest of the sword move around it as I move this point of the sword. So as I'm holding it here, I go, ha-ha, and then thrust in, and the tip stays nice and still. So if I were to try that up here, I go, ha-ha, and can you see the way as I go, ha-ha, the tip comes right down out of the way. But here, it stays put, and I can thrust in with a bit more power. So that's, some people will tell you uh, that the correct balance for a long sword involves the tip, if you hold it just under the quillons like this, staying fairly still when you do that. But with other swords, you'll get a slightly... You see, with, with uh, this sword, Arnanda, even if I hold it here, or hold her here, am I pretentious enough to call her her? I don't know, she's got the girl's name. Um, you can see that the point that stays still is about here. And if I whack it or her on the side, you can see that the point around which she wants to reverberate is about here, which is, I would say, a little bit further down from the tip than I would want. Um, had I forged her with greater skill, I would have got a little bit further up towards the tip. But that's pretty decent. I'm, I'm perfectly happy with that. And the way she handles um, uh, is, is pretty satisfying. So I'm still proud of having made that sword. And since I've got this far, and some of you will be curious, where does this one reverberate? Well, you can see the, the stationary point is about there. So uh, again, actually, I would say maybe the sweet spot should be a tiny bit further up, but it's personal taste to some degree. And what happens when I do this? Well, you can see again that it behaves much more like the long sword. The tip is not moving much. I would say the stationary point is maybe about that sort of height as I wave it around like that. Now, if you have a small, short, simple to use one-handed sword like this, and you plant yourself on the ground, you've got your shield perhaps, and you can fight. Maybe you're in a dense formation, there are a lot of people around you, so you don't want to be doing loads of wild swinging. Um, you can get away with quite a lot of movement with your feet just planted on the ground, and the sword will behave pretty usefully, and you can fight with not having to move your feet a huge amount. I would say, though, that that's not true with this. If you were skirmishing with this, for one thing, the bigger and longer the sword, uh, the more um, you, should ha you have to dance with it. So if I want to take a sweep with this, I will probably, to put a decent amount of power into it, want to move my whole self. Um, and if I want to make a second attack, I want to go there and then straight into another one, I have to, rather than stop, bring it back and have another hack, 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 like that is very primitive. But if I go hack, hack, it, it, I can, I can, um, I'm a little bit nervous actually in this room of, of, of hitting things around me. Um, uh, but can you see that if I cut with the edge that way, I go cut, 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 cut. If I want to carry on cutting with that, I either carry on like this and this gets more and more awkward until I'm doing something like this, that's got to be wrong, or, or else I go cut with the edge, cut, 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 and now I'm sort of swatting with the flat of the blade, and now I'm cutting backwards, not that anyone's likely to be there, and as I come down the other way, I'm now cutting with the blade again, and then I'm swatting with the flat. If I go the other way and cut upwards, I can cut continually with the blade, continually as I turn, and continually that way. So an upwards figure of eight, you can cut constantly, but with a downwards figure of eight, you tend to go cut, and then you've got this awkward, not really doing anything useful, sw a swat, a sideways swat with a flat, and then another cut. But you can swap from what they call the true edge to the false. So this leading edge, sometimes called the true edge, or slightly confusingly, the long edge, even though it's the same length as the back edge, I cut with the true edge, 
And then what I can do is I can swap and come back the other way, cutting all the time, with the false edge, and then swap that into a cut with the true edge, and so forth. You can flow these together, and people who have done a lot more practice than I have have got some beautiful Carter-like routines where they flow loads of big cuts together. But the bigger the saw, as I say, the more you have to do a dance. So if I want to come to a great halt and then bring it back, if I've just flat-footed myself, then I'm horribly vulnerable to that moment. If someone can see that I've just done this huge haymaker of a stroke that comes to a complete halt, uh, then I'm vulnerable. Uh, they could nip in and stab me or whatever. But if I move as I cut in, in, immediately into the, into the next cut and I constantly move with it, I, I have a, a dance using up lots of room, uh, then they will find it very difficult to nip in and get that uh, retaliatory stab in. So the bigger the sword, uh, the more you have to dance about, and so the better your footwork has to be, and uh, the more stuffed you are if you're forced, to, for some reason, to come to a complete halt. Um, yes, I think this is a skirmishing weapon. <laughs>